Good morning, folks, and welcome to this week's episode of the Legal Beagle Podcast. You will notice I said good morning because I usually say good afternoon, but we are going to get at this podcast early today. You'll also notice we're not in the Legal Beagle Library, and that's because I still have not secured a sponsor for that. So if you're interested, let me know, and I'm happy to plug you in every single one of our Legal Beagle podcasts. For the time being, we'll do our podcast here, and I hope I bring you some valuable content this week. This week, we're going to talk about the most common personal injury cases and then some not so common personal injury cases. I think people know uh, what a personal injury case is for the most part. And most people associate that with auto crash cases, what we call motor vehicle accidents or car crashes. Uh, people associate personal injury claims with that type of case because it's the most common type of case that is out there. However, there are a lot of other cases that involve personal injury that people don't normally associate. So we're going to go through a, a few of those today, and then I'm going to direct you to our prior podcasts and blogs because we have a host of content already available for you if you're interested in diving deeper into these different types of cases. So first, let me talk about car crashes. Did you know that there are 6 million car accidents in the U.S. every year? That equates to roughly 16,438 cases per day. That is a lot of car crashes. Here's the good news. The good news is that technology, things like self-driving cars and lane assist and automatic braking and some of the self-driving mechanisms that we already have in place are making accidents fewer and fewer, which is good for all of us, right? We, as personal injury attorneys, are not advocating for crashes to happen. But when they do, we are saying get an attorney involved because they can be an incredible resource when you uh, go through this process. Because there are so many car crashes happening still, there is a need to talk with a personal injury attorney and at least discuss what options are available to you. If you don't want to talk to an attorney, go to our website, negrettilaw.com, click on blogs, which is in the upper right-hand corner, and read all of the content that we've produced over the last few years about what to look for with common car accident cases, car crash cases, and what you may need to be aware of. So that's the most common. The second more common personal injury case is a medical malpractice case. And we actually have interviewed a few different medical malpractice attorneys uh, here in the Phoenix area. We ourselves do uh, medical malpractice cases. And this is what I would tell you, the viewer or listener of this podcast. These cases are incredibly difficult to pursue. Not only are they cost prohibitive, but there are challenges in the law that make these cases difficult. They don't necessarily protect the doctor or the medical practitioner, but they do make you, the, the injured party, uh, have to think about whether or not these cases are worthy of pursuing. And I'll give you an example. We may look at 100 cases related to medical malpractice before we take one. That is a very small ratio of acceptance of these claims. And the reason for that is because you really have to hit three main elements. You have to, one, identify that there was a mistake that occurred with the medical procedure or experience that you were having. Two, that that mistake le led to some sort of injury, and that injury probably has to be fairly significant. And then three, that there are damages as a result of that injury. And so what I mean by damages is that you now have some sort of uh, debilitating outcome because of something that went wrong, that mistake that occurred. And, and you probably don't know those things without having a more in-depth conversation with a, an attorney about whether those three elements are applicable to your case. If you think you have some sort of situation, give us a call. We're happy to evaluate that and discuss that with you. Even if we don't take your case, we're not going to charge you for our time in evaluating uh, that particular uh, event that may have led to some sort of medical malpractice. Another case, 
is uh, what we call a wrongful death case. And that means that someone dies as a result of some personal injury. More commonly, people associate that with a car crash and someone dies as a result of that car crash and then they, they have a wrongful death claim. However, it's important to understand that wrongful death claims can occur through medical malpractice. They can occur through no nursing home neglect. They can occur through construction defects and even uh, product defect cases. And we have a lot of information about those subcategories on our website uh, through the blog page where you can read more about those things and learn uh, more about what to look for and what to be aware of. But what I would tell you as it relates to wrongful death is if you are a beneficiary or potentially the personal representative of the estate of the person that was uh, killed as a result of a personal injury claim, that's it's important to have a conversation. And I'll, I'll use an example without divulging any confidential information. We had a gal whose husband uh, passed away as a result of a uh, personal injury on an electric scooter. And she had to know some answers before she could put this to bed and, and move forward with her life. We spent about a year investigating this for her. There ended up not being a claim that she wanted to pursue. And so we parted ways. We didn't charge her for any of our time or the costs that we spent investigating that because that's the risk of us doing this work. And really we are in the business of trying to help people find answers. And, and we found those answers for her and she was able to um, move forward knowing that, that she had done everything she could to look into uh, that potential claim. Premise liability is another area that is very common in personal injury. And that just simply means that, you know, property owners have a duty to safe keep their property. These are legal terms that lawyers that are listening to this will appreciate, but that someone who's not a lawyer would say, what does that mean? It just means that they have to, uh, they are, property owners are responsible for the premises that they own and they have to make sure that they inspect and have a duty to protect those that are on their property from injury. That can come uh, in a residential setting where you, someone's on your someone's on your property at your house. That can come in a commercial setting where you're at a grocery store. Uh, we just did an entire blog about premise liability cases. We actually interviewed a premise liability expert, Mr. Todd Springer, and so there's a podcast and a blog about that interview and I would urge you to go listen to that and listen to what he's saying. This is a third party, not an attorney, but an expert that actually works on these claims day in and day out about what he's saying to look for and be aware of before uh, pursuing these claims. Another type of uh, very common or, or another type of uh, personal injury claim that is common is product liability claims. and. Uh, this is where you sustain an injury as a result of a defective product, uh, failure to warn on a product, uh, your injury or um, the, the harm that was caused as a result of a product. The most common or most popular case involving a product defect claim is the McDonald's coffee cup case. And what I'll tell you if you're rolling your eyes is go read the blog on our website. That's at negrettilaw.com. Click on the blogs and you'll see this is, I think, on the first page of our blogs because we did it just recently. There's a blog about the common mistakes associated with that McDonald's coffee cup case. And I urge you to read that and educate yourself before you just make a quick judgment as to whether or not you know everything there is to know about that case because it's much different in actuality than it is in the perception that exists out there in, in, the, uh, in the world. So in addition to that, we did a blog on the five most famous product liability cases. And I urge you to read that as well because you may be a little astounded and maybe a little upset about the egregious conduct of some of these companies. Look, we're not saying that you as the injured party don't bear some responsibility with some of these things but there is a point at which that burden shifts to the maker of the product to protect all of us against harm right and and we talk about this in and i've talked about this in in videos that are on our website in in podcasts that i've done in the past and certainly in some of the blogs that we've authored so go look at that information to learn a little bit more about that another common area of personal injury is defamation. And this is one that we don't talk about a lot, uh, frankly, because these cases are very complicated. Although I have done 
uh, some blogs in the past about defamation. Uh, defamation typically comes in the form of either libel or slander. Here's the difference. Slander, which starts with the letter S, is spoken. So slander, S, spoken, S, right? So think slander, spoken, libel, written. So when you're talking about these potential claims against uh, someone who's harmed and you use those, those terms interchangeably, they're not the same. So if someone is uh, defamed, they can either have, uh, they can be slandered, which is someone spoke about it, or they could, it could be libel, which is someone has written about it. And you hear these claims most often related to the entertainment industry. And that's because uh, these claims have to be actionable. They have to have some damages. Here's, here's the one thing you need to understand. They have to be untrue. If the statement is true, but you just don't like it, that's not slander or libel. That doesn't necessarily uh, allow you to bring a defamation claim. In fact, it's the ultimate defense to defamation claims when a statement is true. So make sure the statement is untrue, not that you just don't like what's being said about you. Second to that, you have to prove that you have damages as a result of that. And it can't be, I my feelings were hurt. That's not enough to bring a defamation claim. It has to be some sort of actionable damages, something that occurred as a result of that. So maybe uh, an example would be a former employer defames you in some way and that prevents you from getting a job and that job equated to a hundred thousand dollar salary that and you can prove all of this right it isn't just simply that you heard some rumors you know that there were statements made maybe you have something in writing which we libel or something spoken and a third party can uh cooperate that and they say yeah that they said some untrue things about you not a job reference is made and, and they say look they're not hireable again by our company that's that's not an untrue statement that may be a very true statement but something that is actually harmful and dishonest about you and then you lose the right to that job there could be a defamation claim there so these claims are, are difficult you need to understand that opinion testimony is different from statements of fact so someone gives an opinion about something that isn't necessarily the same thing as giving and stating a fact about a person these claims are challenging and, and difficult to unpack. So again, if you think you have this sort of situation, then give us a call and we'll talk through it and see if there's an actual claim to pursue. The last most common uh, type of claim is a dog bite claim. And here's a stat that I saw that was just startling to me. There are roughly 4.5 million dog bites each year. Dog bite claims have their own little set of rules that govern them. and the the most common thing that, or the most uh, important thing that you should be aware of is that dog bite claims usually carry with them what's called a one year statute of limitations. We've talked about this in the past. Let's use normal words. One year deadline to bring your claim or file your lawsuit. If you don't do that within one year, you could lose the right uh, to these claims. Depending on where this happens, and we have offices in California, Arizona, and Colorado, the laws are different in, in those three states. So depending on where it happens, you may automatically have a claim regardless of any sort of defense that can be offered, where in some other states, uh, there could be defenses like Colorado, where there has to be a prior bite in order to bring a claim. There are circumstances that surround those events that you need to be aware of and, and talk through. But if you were bit by a dog and you think you have a claim, give us a call. Let's talk about that potential uh, circumstances or those circumstances that surround your, your event. And let's decide if there's a, a claim to pursue. Dogs shouldn't be biting people. There are defenses like provocation where you provoke the dog. There are other defenses that uh, could be used by the uh, dog owner to defend their, their dog. But if you were bit and you were injured, then more likely than not, there probably is a claim to pursue. And there, there typically could be a source of recovery through homeowners insurance or other uh, potential avenues of, of pursuit. So make sure that you, you do think about those things. And again, information on our website for you to read and, and consider before bringing those claims. But we're happy to have that conversation with you. Now, let's talk about some not so common personal injury cases. And these are ones that we pride ourselves on pursuing. Some are, are done just simply because we think it's our duty as attorneys to do so. Some are done because there aren't a lot of attorneys doing these claims and we think someone 
needs to help these people and represent them. The first one is diminished value. Diminished value has to do with a uh, vehicle claim where your vehicle loses value because of a car crash. Your vehicle gets repaired and now it's worth less because of the damage that occurred during your car crash. These are claims where they really, we try to educate a lot of people on these claims because you really are equipped to bring these claims and you don't want to be giving away a chunk of your recovery to an attorney to simply process papers. However, there are times where the insurance company makes it very difficult and you're going to have to get an attorney involved if you want to pursue these claims. We have a ton of information on our website. In fact, we have a video that we can send you that's about 30 minutes long that I walk through a lot of different scenarios and talk to you about how to protect yourself. So if you have interest in these claims, go to our website first, click on our diminished value page. There's a lot of resources there. There's the blogs that we've also done. And then if you wanna watch that video that we've recorded, send us a note or call us and we'll send it over to you and you can take a look at that. Another type of case that is not so common are electric electric scooter cases. And we have a ton of information about this on our website as well. These are cases where you're on one of those electric scooters, maybe a bird or lime or, or uh, there's a bunch of different ones that are still out in the marketplace. Some, some con consolidation has occurred now. We're noticing that companies are buying other companies. And so there may not be as many competitors in this space, but these are those electric scooters that are put out in high traffic areas where you can swipe your credit card, use an app, and off you go and you're racing down the street at a high rate of speed and you get injured in some way. And those injuries can occur by you getting hit by a vehicle, by a person running in front of you, uh, by you simply having to fall off or jump off the scooter because the brakes fail or uh, maybe there's a, a sharp turn that you're not uh, able to, to negotiate. These claims are also complicated because most of these scooter companies are based out of California most of these scooters, I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, we had some technical difficulties with Photo Booth, which as a little aside, I was watching a show and it was based in 2010 or 2011. And I guess Photo Booth was around back then. Maybe it was 2015. I, I, I don't know how long ago, but I was surprised to see Photo Booth. I didn't realize that Mac had Photo Booth on there computers for quite some time. Anyway, what I was talking about was electric scooters and the arbitration agreements that could be present in these user agreements that you sign. The arbitration, I guess it's not really a, an agreement, although you do agree to it, but the arbitration uh, provision in these user agreements says that you have to arbitrate your cases. You can't necessarily file them in a court of law and it has to happen in California. So we've had attorneys from all over the country asking us to help them pursue these cases because we are licensed in California and they are not. And these injuries can occur anywhere. So they may occur in, let's say, Georgia, for example, but the uh, arbitration or the, the place where the hearing needs to be held is in California. So they need a California attorney to, to help them. So we're able to do that. And if you get injured on, on one of these electric, electric scooters, excuse me, then definitely give us a call. Let's talk about what happened because there just frankly aren't a lot of folks out there doing this. And we think that people should be better educated, better informed, and understand what their rights are as it relates to bringing a claim for an injury that occurs on an electric scooter. Lastly, uh, rideshare cases. These are cases that usually involve Lyft or Uber. And these are situations where you get into a car crash, you could be a passenger, you could be a driver, you could be a driver of another vehicle that's hit by someone driving a passenger or going to pick up a passenger. There are specifics about these cases that change what insurance is available and when the, the rideshare company has to come into the picture and cover some of these uh, injuries that resulted from an accident with a rideshare company, whether it's, again, a driver of a rideshare like Lyft or Uber, whether you're a passenger, whether you're another vehicle, whether you're a pedestrian, all those things come into play. There's a ton of information about how insurance coverages may apply on our website through our uh, ride, share, ride share section of our website, as well as through our blogs. And then you can certainly give us a call and we can talk through those specifics and see if we can assist. So that's a list of 
common personal injury cases as well as not so common personal injury cases to just educate you a little bit more on the different types of situations that you may find yourself in and the questions that you may have if you find yourself in those situations. So I hope you enjoyed this week's blog. We'll be back next week with a new Legal Beagle podcast. Until then, take care. 